Did maybe, you not get things that I know about? Like, did you not get things that are that became famous? Um, yeah, <clears throat> a lot of them. I mean, the one that comes to mind is super bad. You've been doing this for a really long time. You've been acting since you were like five years old. Yeah. I mean, I made my first movie in Toronto. You didn't. Which I just learned we don't say the T, but it sounds, but, but, but we won't get it. Can we I don't have to get something? into that. But. So I'm not from here and I say the T and you, I get a bit of a hard time for it, but I say the okay. T. I say Toronto. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'll just go, you know. Because Toronto doesn't feel like it's that feels like it would be spelled T O R A N O. T O R A N Toronto. Like Toronto. Yeah. Um, but but any, yeah. I lean into I lean into the T a little bit. Okay. Toronto. So I made my first movie in Toronto. That's spectacular. When I was eleven. Um, so Toronto is very close to my heart. Um, but also. Yeah, I started very young, even before that, with plays and auditioning in New York and doing theater in New York. And, um, you know, I was on Good Morning America doing a bit when I was six. The, the story, I, as far as I, as I understand it, is that was it your, your dad took some acting classes and sort of did some exercises with you. Is, is that the story? Yeah. So he was in the record business for a long time. Uh, he was designing album covers and logos and designed the Rolling Stones tongue. And, no way. Yeah. Worked on Sticky Fingers and Tommy the Rock Opera for The Who and did all these kind of iconic things in the music industry. But he had this dream of being an actor for his whole life. And um, as things were turning into CDs and CDs were turning into iTunes downloads, like he was in this this point in his life where he was like, I don't know how to design things in the way that I was doing it before. And, and so he, he had this dream of being an actor and he started taking classes while he was working the day job in the music industry still yeah, in like a corporate kind of way. And he would study at night. And then on the weekends, my parents were divorced. So on the weekends I would see him and for whatever reason he thought I would want to know. So he would tell me about the things he learned that week and we would run scenes and help him prepare for auditions and eventually look for auditions for me and run my audition sides with him. And, um, so it was, yeah, it was just contagious, I guess, or I was just lucky enough to be exposed to something that maybe I wouldn't have been yeah. otherwise. I guess maybe also like you had an idea that there was such a thing as a career in the arts because if your dad was designing the the tongue logo for the Rolling Stones and, and Tommy and these kind of iconic, really actually quite iconic now that I think about it, mm -hmm. album covers and, and album logos, the idea of having a career in the arts must have felt like accessible to you. Yeah, he'd made a whole living of it for 40 years. Yeah. So I guess there was that. And my mom had modeled and acted a little bit. So yeah, the path towards something a little bit more... Uh, straight and narrow wasn't yeah it wasn't really being presented and then and you were you were in like disney films right you did some disney work when you were a kid yeah i did i did my first big film was called sky high and that was um in 2004 2005 and that was a big like disney superhero movie about the the children of superheroes going to high school um and that was my first Disney film, then I did a couple Disney Channel movies, DCOMs, as they call them. Oh, I didn't know that. Disney Channel original movies. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, <laughs> so I did two DCOMs, and then I went back and did a movie called Prom that went into theaters. So I had a bit of a Disney era. In all seriousness, a lot of people who I would talk to who sort of come up in sort of a child actory way or even a teen actory way, mm. they either kind of get themselves in trouble or they don't want to do it anymore. You know, it was sort of something that was placed on them or something that they did out of their own volition, but as they get older, they, you know, it's not something they wanted in, in their lives. Did that, did, that, did that come to you at all? Um, yeah, I think there have been certain points where I'm like, it's not enough really just to be an actor. Like, even now when I'm making the show, I'll have two weeks off or something and... 
you know, or even like work a day and then have three days off, then work another day. And I'm like, I just want to keep it going. Like, I just want to be there. And it's the nature of being on, on, in, uh, in anything, you're just not in every scene. Um, and so even that, but, but years ago and right before succession, especially, I was kind of feeling like, you know, I want to make things. So I was starting to make music. I think, you know, that's, we we were talking about that last time. Like I wanted to write and I wanted to produce and I wanted to sing and, you know, write lyrics, perform the songs. Like so much of that is just self-generated. And then as an actor, you're kind of dropped into something. You play a specific part, like literally, um, to the show, but you're not a part of the, the whole thing. So, you know, an auditioning is its own kind of existential hell um, because you get the the sort of potential of something, the potential to be in this big thing that could be career changing, the potential to be seen in a different way. You think you're getting close. You do a callback. You meet all these people. Maybe you're going to get it. And then you don't get it. And you're like, well, why didn't I get it? And did maybe, you not get things that I know about? Like, did you not get things that are that became famous? Um yeah. <clears throat> a lot of them. I mean, the one that comes to mind is super bad. Oh, what one were you going to be? I was up for the Michael Sarah part. Right. And I had maybe three auditions, four auditions, and I read in front of Seth Rogen and those guys. So I got pretty far, but, you know, but that just didn't go. And that was, I was like, obsessed with the movie and thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever read and uh and that which doesn't happen often like most things are humorous but they don't make you like yeah. crack up when you're reading them yeah there have been a lot and it's a part of it that you just have to accept you're gonna get your heart broken you never lot. were like I'm gonna <clears throat> give this up I'm gonna go back to school or I'm gonna not go back to school maybe make music or maybe make music yeah yeah yeah. A su- succession came as I'd taken a bit of like a self-imposed hiatus yeah. on acting. And I moved to San Francisco. I was living with my brother. And and that was just because, you know, it, you just, you have no control as an actor. Like you literally don't have a schedule. You know, like when I was auditioning, I would, you know, on a Sunday, I don't know what my week is like. On a Monday, I have something for Tuesday, Tuesday, something, you know, or... Or nothing. And like, how do you kill time if you don't have a schedule? And so I just didn't, I just can't <laughs> live like that. I just need to know what I'm doing. And and so if you can create it yourself, yeah. um, that was starting to feel really good. So music was was definitely one way to do that. But then succession comes in and you're like, oh, wow, this is the, this is the career defining thing I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, okay, well, this just presented itself. So this is the thing I should be... Um, Focusing on with Succession, did you feel automatically like okay, this is gonna this is gonna be what it became because it's one of the biggest shows in the world right now? I had no clue. Um, you know, Adam McKay was directing. The script was very good, but tonally, I wasn't sure what it was because my stuff was super funny, but at the core of the show is quite dramatic and. Um, the themes that were in the the Logan Kendall sibling part of the show were not the same as with me and Tom and my, you know, so I just wasn't, I was never really sure how I would fit into it. Um, but, but yeah, when you're making something and it's that early on and no one's seen it and I, none of us have seen it. We don't know what the episodes are like. Yeah. We haven't heard the theme song. Yeah. You know, we don't know the vibe of it. Yeah. Was it hard to make too? But like, because I think about you coming in as, I mean, any actor at all, right. But to come in, with people like Brian Cox, who's this like esteemed juggernaut British uh, actor, Matthew McFadgen, who's mm-hmm. like this Jane Austenian, uh, nice. you know, thank you, uh, you know, great uh, actor, Jeremy Strong, who, you know, it was, enough has been said about Jeremy Strong and his yeah. like, incredible, Sarah Snook is like this incredible Australian actor. Were you feeling any of that? I could tell that everybody was good. Like Kieran Culkin. Oh, yeah. Is, you're like, oh, yeah, he's sharp. 
I heard he's he can memorize a with... script in like a second too, right? He can. Yeah. Yeah. He's very good at it. I've This season I saw him like not know a scene and in two takes he fully knew the scene. Crazy. He would just go out in between takes and like look at his sides and it was like a six page scene and he, he got it. Um, pretty, pretty wild. But, but yeah, I guess I could tell everybody was very good, like understood their parts, but also, you know, actors are only as good as like the, the, all the dimension that they bring into it. You know, you can be directed and you can be shot a certain way and execute the lines a certain way, but all these actors came in with like such a strong idea of what these characters were. So then you're in the room, like during the pilot in the birthday party scene, you know, I'm walking, I just like, I'm seeing it now, like I'm walking into the room and I've got my little gift and Matthew's there and, and he's got his like box with the watch in it. And he's looking me up and down and immediately it's like, Oh, that's the relationship there. He's checking me out. I'm checking him out. Okay. That's how we, we relate to each other. And then Kieran and Snook are sort of like, who the fuck are you? You know, Greg, Craig, all that stuff. Yeah. Their confusion is very, like, feels like it's based in, like, a context. Like, like there's history that they know me, but they don't know me. So you can start to feel all these, like, mi- like little micro dynamics. And that comes from actors being, like, very sure of, you know, what things mean to them um, yeah. and mean to their character. So the detail was, like, all there very quickly. We had Matthew in. We had Matthew over Zoom. He told me that he really only breaks with you. Like, you you guys have this ability to break. Well, that's very kind. But I think, I think other, I think Kieran probably makes him break sometimes. But we do have, it's, I would say, different because we've, we know each other's faces so well that, like, if he starts to do, like, a little thing with, the side of his mouth I'm like I know he's trying to hold laughter in right now right I know he's trying to keep it together uh which will break me but like an audience would never have seen that little thing like we could have just kept shooting but instead I see it and I'm like so happy that he's laughing and then it the whole thing falls apart uh but but uh yeah we break constantly it's it's been a problem is there a scene that I would know from the show that was particularly hard when he's giving his testimony in Congress yeah. and I'm right behind him, it was very hard to keep it together because I know I'm right behind him, but also because it was all the Tomlet, Greg can't. It's hard make to make a, a Tomlet. Tomlet without breaking a few Gregs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and knowing what he's doing right in front of me, like I already know what he's doing. So I just had to think a lot of bad thoughts and look down and. Yeah, because cause on all of his coverage, I'm probably going to be seen. So I don't want to ruin his coverage by laughing. Right. Um, the camera's on him. You're in the background. But I'm you in the background. You don't want to ruin his take by being in the background and laughing at what yes. you think he is doing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the most important thing is not ruining takes. I, like, I've, I feel so guilty when a take was going really well, and then I break, and we lost it. There was one scene where I get put in, like, the, sh- the mail room office yeah yeah the terrible office yeah and there's all this old furniture in there and yeah yeah and there was some stuff in there that was really funny and and on the way out he like i'm i think it's that scene where i'm following him as if we're both going to leave the office together once he puts me in there and he turns around he's like no stay and i couldn't get through it i just couldn't i couldn't get through it it was because it's. It sounds so easy to get through, but yeah. but when he's treating me like a dog, <laughs> stay. It's just too. I don't know. The person who can, who has a has a an easier time not breaking, is the person who's on the offense in a scene. Right. So if they're driving it or they're the one like you know saying something. Yeah. It's way harder to just react blankly, you know. Because you don't have anything, you don't have anything to say or do that you can like distract yourself from finding it funny. But if I'm watching Matthew doing something and it's really good, like it's it's yeah. it's hard to. You're on the back foot. There's nothing you can do. You're, yeah, you know, you're reacting to it. It's yeah, hard, it's hard yeah. not to do that. There's some stuff this season that 
other people were cracking up as I was doing it, but I had something to be super busy and obsessed with. Right. And that's why you I could just focus on. Yeah. Yeah. I can focus on the action and, and all that. When, when did you find out that this is the last season? We found out about, Did you all find out together at the same time or? Yeah. I think Jesse told a couple of groups over Zoom. Um, he got us together and, and he just said, you know, just so you know, it looks like it'll probably be the end. Um, I might be working on the season and find some new storyline and feel like, oh, we can extend it to another to another season. But it feels like to me the, so- the story will best be served by uh, ending it here and just have 10 monster episodes to bring us out. It's a very – I know Jesse's like a British – a writer and t- TV maker, and he yeah. made Peep Show, which is one of my favorite shows of all time. Mm-hmm. It's a very British thing to do, right? To to not end it with people like me wanting a bit more, you know? Yeah, I think so. I mean, he's he's just not one to ever indulge too much in what's good. So, yeah. like, if something's really funny, I mean, Tom and Greg stuff gets pretty fucking amazing, you know, like. That you're like, oh yes, you're giving me everything, and so that that can sometimes veer a little bit into that. But generally, Jesse likes to withhold. So if we ever go too far into the comedy, if it ever, you know, if if Greg ever gets like too dumb or silly or or says stuff that's just not real, he, he he's like, wait, wait. He's got a very good radar for that stuff, and so I'm sure in thinking about extending the show and how long can it go, it's like. He's not going to go too far. How are you doing with that? How are you doing with the show being being over? I feel good about it. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, I feel really proud of all the work that we did, and then I feel really proud of this season. I mean, this season's amazing. Um, were you sad at all? Were you... I mean, or were you kind of like, yeah, this makes sense? I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, it, it was sad. It was... The last day was really hard, and... Um, and there were some times during the season that felt like, okay, that's the last time we'll be on this set. Last time I'll work with that actor, you know, uh, last time I'll do a scene with Matthew, you know, those are, those are tough moments, but I, I, I do think we did a great job and, um, and we did it for six and a half years from the start of the pilot till now. So. Yeah, it was a big chapter of our lives. It really did change your life, man. Like it did, yeah. Um, when you 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 do some photography, am I right about that? Yeah. The question I have is an, is an honest one, which is that I think when you're a photographer, you sort of see life differently. You sort of see life in in series of of images. You know what I mean? Like in sort of series of stills. Mm-hmm. And when you now that we're able to sort of look back on your time in succession. If I was to ask you for like the image that comes to your mind when you sort of reflect on on that experience you've had, what's the one that comes to mind? I don't know. I guess I don't have a great answer. There's no real. I took a lot of pictures. Like I took. Okay. I, I shot a lot of pictures, like throughout the throughout the seasons. H- how about so, your favorite photo you took during your time at, at Succession? Well, you took a lot of pictures. What's, yeah. What's your What's your fave? What's the like, the most important one to you? You know what I mean? Like what's the yeah. most? Yeah. I mean, the one I'm thinking of right now, there's one of Brian standing outside the castle, the Hungarian castle with all the dead boars from the day around him yeah. in like a fire. And, uh, and Brian's like stood tall and like all these dead boars are around him. Uh, that one st- stands out. I hope that we still get to hang out and talk to one another even now that the show's over. Yeah, absolutely. 